about it. There's always been an assumption, for example, that agencies like the DOJ and FBI are, quote, independent. That's like Washington speak. Oh, these are these are independent. President can't be involved in those agencies. And when they say that DOJ and FBI are independent, what they're saying is they think they should be unaccountable. So these are the agencies that can imprison you, arrest and imprison you, and they shouldn't be accountable to the one person elected in that branch? Give me a break. Welcome to the Larry Arn Show. I would be that man, Larry Arn. Uh, this is the first edition of that show, and I've got a spectacular guest. Uh, because the guest is in politics, I will say at the outset that Hillsdale College is not a partisan institution, except that it loves the Constitution of the United States and limited government of which it is a creature and has been from its beginning in 1844. I'm proud to have our guest today because he's important and he's important because he knows things and he does things that are remarkable in our politics today. Uh, welcome, Governor. It's great to be here. My first time. Yeah, I wanted it, to come. We've talked about it for a long time, so I'm glad we finally got it done. Yeah, high time. Um, I want to talk about, you've got a book out uh, called Courage to be Free. Interesting that it takes courage to be free, but it always has, and especially now today. And it begins with a a discussion of a man that I met first in 1974 by the name of Angelo Cotavilla. I will tell you that the book is in the mood of the decline of the Roman Republic. You call the government we have today the regime. You call the media the Praetorian Guard. Those are grim words if you know that history. Is that where you think we are? Well, I think that uh, part of the book is juxtaposing the success of Florida uh, with the decline of our country. And I noticed this when I was running for re-election, that Floridians were really ex happy to be Floridians. They were really happy about the direction of the state, but they were so incredibly pessimistic about the direction of the country, about what was going on, not just in D.C., but with the elites in our society more broadly, yes, in the corporate press, Wall Street, all these other places. And it causes you to kind of take a step back, survey, what's the America was like when I was growing up? I mean, I kind of graduated high school in the, in the late 90s, and we were probably the most powerful country in the history of the world. There's certainly one of them there. We were really at our peak, and it seems like over the last 20 plus years, we've stubbed our toe time and time again, and uh, we're not as strong as we were then. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, I think some of the behavior of our ruling class is, is first among them, uh, but there are other things. And so, yes, the country is not doing well, but I think that there is a positive aspect of the book to just show that what we put together in Florida shows that all the different folks who are making things worse in the country, those are the same folks we beat time and time again on all these issues in Florida, and we've now become the citadel of freedom in the United States. Uh, well, the book certainly is a very hopeful book, but we're not ready to go there yet. We're going to talk about all the bad stuff first. Uh, Tell, tell us about this ruling class. Who are they and what makes them what they are? Well, I think Cota Villa was really the first to really crystallize this for me. He wrote an essay probably 10, 12 years ago at this point. And um, what he pointed out was these are folks in, in different organs of society. It's not like a conspiracy or anything, but they all have the same basic assumptions about the way the world should operate, about how they should be able to exercise power over other people and so that is really the, the governing ideology, not just of our bureaucracy, not just of our elected class, but even people in high finance and the media and all this. And so it creates kind of an elite cadre across institutions. Uh, and then you kind of have the rest of us who feel differently, and, and we're kind of the, the, the country folk. Uh, it's different, and I think he pointed this out. You know, if you were 100 years ago, you would have been, if you're a Northeastern business guy, all those people kind of thought the same. There were big regional differences in the country. And I think with the advent of, of kind of progressive ideology infecting all these institutions, a lot of those differences are now muted because they're united by their overall leftism. We're somehow able to act together. Uh, in some ways, the country, do you think, is more centralized than it used to be? National media big engines of search and all that stuff. Uh, what do you do about that? 
Well, I think just in the in my adult lifetime, that's true. I mean, when big tech came on the scene, it was very liberating in many respects. Uh, it was a way to get around the legacy media, and you could communicate ideas. Uh, that has changed in the last five or ten years, where tech works in concert uh, with the bureaucracy. Uh, to be able to limit information. So we saw this during COVID-19 when Fauci is talking with Facebook about what is, quote, misinformation. Of course, everything they said was misinformation is basically things that ended up being true, whether that the virus came from the lab, whether it's that the cloth masks were ineffective, all these different things. And so, yes, you have more people in high positions of authority working in concert to be able to advance an agenda. And that's just, I think, an agenda that is not in the best interest of the majority of the people of our country. You quote Madison. You quote the founders a lot, accurately. Uh, whenever the real power in a government, wherever the real power in a government lies, there is danger of oppression. Wherever there is an interest and in power to do wrong, wrong will generally be done, and not less readily by a powerful and interested party than by a powerful and interested prince. Uh, is that what we have now? We have a, a people who think they can control elections and think that they're in the right, and if you oppose them, they will prosecute you. Well, certainly I think the difference between maybe how government operates today and, say, when President Reagan came on the scene, President Reagan said the most dangerous words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, and, and it was true. But a lot of that was kind of central planning run amok. These were do-gooders that thought they could socially engineer society. Of course, it didn't work. Uh, and so Reagan pointed that out. I think now it's a much sharper use of government authority. I do think that they c conceive of themselves as representing one faction of society uh, against an other factions of society. And so you see dissimilar treatment of people. I saw this my first year in Congress when the IRS targeting scandal happened. They were going after these little conservative groups, even in my district, these groups of citizens. And so, so I think that that's something that's significant. I also think that concentration of power, the founders were really concerned about government power. I think they'd be surprised at the extent to which uh, these private companies are exercising de facto public power, really, I think, on behalf of the regime, and whether that's the, the banks colluding to do things like ESG, uh, whether that's tech colluding to censor, you know, that's power being exercised in ways that are not accountable to the electorate. So here's a, a delicate thing, and I think a very bold thing. Um, uh, it requires the prudent use of political power to break up these centers of power in politics and outside that are oppressing people. Can you do that safely? Well, I don't know that we have any other choice but to try. I mean, if you think about it, what we have now is, you know, I can win an election in Florida by a million and a half votes, and yet if I'm not diligent about protecting my people, the left can still impose their agenda through universities, through corporate America, through tech companies, through the federal bureaucracy. Uh, and so I think someone in my position, you know, I've got to be able to use my constitutional authority to be able to safeguard the liberty of my citizens, not just against my own government getting out of hand. That's easy for me to do, but also against all these other arteries of society that have been infected by people that don't have their best interests at heart. In your book, you identify Congress as the mainstream of government because it makes the laws, and you say that the hope is with them. Uh, effectively, you say that. You don't say it in those, those words. Uh, what's wrong with Congress? You are in the Congress. So if you go back, and you know this well, the Federalist 51 articulated that the premise of our Constitution by having separate branches and having the ability to check each other was that ambition would counteract ambition. You're the executive. By human nature, you want to expand your power. I'm in the Congress. It's human nature. We want our, our branch to be the most powerful. So you'd be fighting back and forth. What's happened with the modern Congress is their desire to remain in office has inverted that to where it's easier for them to remain in office if they punt on all these important issues. So they would rather draft vague legislation that punts the critical decisions to the bureaucracy so that they have plausible deniability in a reelection campaign. They would rather keep the government going on autopilot 
rather than use the power of the purse in a way that would, that would provoke a confrontation with the executive because they don't want to, quote, government shutdown, and they don't want to, quote, be blamed for a government shutdown. So I think the modern Congress has put its individual members' desire to remain in office in perpetuity ahead of the institution's prerogatives to be what should be the most powerful branch of the government. Because you could have a runaway executive, pa- Congress can just simply not fund those activities, and it stops. And so unless Congress is taking affirmative action to keep the government doing these things, those those behaviors will cease, but they just don't have the gumption to be able to do it. So I wouldn't say I'm hopeful that that will change. I do think that there's a bigger recognition, at least amongst Republicans who are in Congress now, that it has to change because otherwise what the bureaucracy, you know, you know, people, we call it a, a deep state. People say, oh, it's a conspiracy theory. It's not a conspiracy theory. When there's no constitutional accountability, you're going to have power uh, accumulate and it's going to be wielded in ways that are going to be detrimental. That's, that's basically 101 from what our founders thought. So they need to get serious about exercising their authority. Uh, and I think the decades of them defaulting on that responsibility have led to where we are now. Uh, you mentioned a few things that executives can do to turn that around. It sounds like you've done some of them. Can you? What are those? Well, look, at the federal level, uh, well, so one of the things I did when I became governor is I had my, my staff in the transition give me, a, a, I was like, compile a book of every possible authority I have, constitutional, statutory, customary powers that may have been used. What are my powers vis-a-vis local government? Because I've removed local government officials. What about the legislature? So I had all that. And so you're like, okay, what levers can you pull to advance an agenda? And I think in the, at the federal level under Article Two, you know, there are certain levers that, that can be pulled. I mean, I talk about in the book how one way to deal with the bureaucracy is to take all the employees who exercise pow- uh, policymaking dis- decisions and classify them as a different schedule under federal civil service where they're not, they don't have the ironclad protections so that they can be removed. I mean, after all, if you are making these judgments, uh, Article 2 says the, execu- the elected president has the, has the right to wield executive power. If you're making policy judgments that are undercutting that, you should be shown the door. That would need to be put in. Obviously, it would be challenged uh, by the left. Uh, and then I also think, and we just had a judge um, in the Fifth Circuit, Judge Ho, write a concurrence saying, we need to determine whether Article 2 is, is improperly circumscribed by some of these uh, civil service laws. Because if you think about it right now, what we have is a Republican get elected president and the left still controls the, the organs of the executive branch. That's not the way the Constitution was designed. It's one thing to have a civil service protection. If I'm like some, somebody in the bowels of the bureaucracy and you're working for me, maybe I can't just fire you at will. But to have that apply to the elected president where they can't make changes to be able to effectuate their agenda. Uh, that's not the way it's done. Now, the Democrats love it because they're in charge no matter what happens, uh, the way this has gone on for the last 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, could that, you, you call that Schedule F in your book. Can, can, can the president do that? Well, I think this was something in the previous administration that a lot of us were, were hoping for. Uh, I think they tried to do it maybe at the very end. It just didn't, it didn't really get off the ground. But, but yeah, I think, I think you can do it. I think it'll be litigated. But I think there are members on the uh, U.S. Supreme Court now who've seen the way this bureaucracy is, is operating, and, they, and I think they'll recognize, I think a majority of the court will recognize that's not consistent with the original understanding of the Constitution. You mentioned the number 50,000. Yeah. That's, that's a few. Yeah. <laughs> It'd make a difference. Uh, I know a lot of people who've worked in the executive branch uh, in in D.C., uh, it's a fearsome thing to do because people are out to get you. No and, question. And they, um, they can hurt you. But I think that some of this has been, there's always been an assumption that there's nothing you can do about it. There's always been an assumption, for example, that agencies like the DOJ and FBI are, quote, independent. That's like Washington speak. Oh, these are, these are independent. President can't be involved in those agencies. And when they say that DOJ and FBI are independent, what they're saying is they think they should be unaccountable. So these are the agencies that can imprison you. 
arrest and imprison you, and they shouldn't be accountable to the one person elected in that branch? Give me a break. So I think Republican uh, uh, executive in particular, you know, you've got to be exercising proper oversight and holding those agencies personally accountable. You can't just say that they're independent and hands off. You can't do anything. That's not the way the system's designed. Hey, it's Scott Bertram, and I want to tell you about something new from Hillsdale College. It's the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. If you want to come close to stepping inside a Hillsdale College classroom, well, the Hillsdale College Podcast Network is for you. Get informed and get entertained at podcast.hillsdale.edu. I'm almost afraid to tell this story. I know somebody who was senior in the FBI. He was retired now. And I was talking to him, and uh, I wasn't talking to him about the FBI, really. And as he was leaving, I said, I hope you're not mixed up in all that. And he said, I'm just trying to keep the FBI independent. And I said, independent of what? And he said, nobody ever asked me that question before. You see? And there, these but people care. That's a million dollar question. And I think what they'll try to say is, well, we want it to be independent of, quote, politics. And yes, is it appropriate for an elected executive to say, FBI, I don't like this person. You go, you go, hurrah. Of course not. That's an abuse of power. But it's wholly appropriate to go bring in the FBI director and say, wait a minute, all these BLM rioters, how come none of them have been held accountable? How come you're going after these people and not these people? You absolutely could do that, and you should do that. And if they don't have a good answer, the FBI director should be fired, and you should put someone else in there. Yeah. And I, I, I sometimes think, I've been saying this for years, I resent you just a little bit because you figured out quicker than I did a whole bunch of stuff. But... Um, uh, I've been saying for years, don't the people understand that the only ones who really answer to them are the ones they vote for? That's right. Shouldn't they be in authority? And I talk a little bit about the books. You know, I was a con- U.S. congressman for three terms, and most of what my constituents would contact my office about had nothing to do with what I was voting on or anything that was before the Congress. It was action that had been taken against them or pending action in some new rule or something, from the bureaucracy. So they're coming to me for help for what the executive branch is basically doing without any prompting from Congress. They're just deciding they want to do a new rule or something. And I'm like, gee, it's not really the way it should be. I mean, these constituents should be coming to Congress, asking the congressman about different things that Congress is doing, but instead all the action was done via executive agencies. I want to talk to you about the pandemic for a minute. Uh... Uh, I know th- I, I have these three guys. I call them my three geniuses. Uh, Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Koldorf, and Scott Atlas, and you work with at least two of them yourself. And you went through, through a process that was just like the one I went through here. That is, I wanted to figure out if the people around here were going to be harmed by this virus. And I wasn't prepared just to listen to the constantly shifting things from the CDC and the Michigan governor. The health department. And so I started trying to find out. And I found out pretty quick that it's extremely unlikely that this virus would hurt a young person. And so then that, that liberated something, you know, because here the kids live in dormitories. You can't keep them apart. Also, they walk around with a sense of immortality all the time. You can't make them afraid either. And you don't really want to unless it's right. So we kept the college open. You kept Florida open. And how'd you do that? Explain that. Well, a lot of it was, I, in fact, I dealt with all, I uh, consulted with all three of those guys. Um, they're all really good. And then looking at the data myself, I mean, COVID was potentially an existential threat for the state of Florida for two reasons. One, we have so many elderly people. We have almost 4,000 long-term care facilities throughout our state. We've got condominiums up and down the coast, particularly in Southern Florida, where a lot of elderly people are there. So a virus that impacts elderly disproportionately impacts Florida disproportionately. Also, to the extent this was disrupting the economy, we rep- uh, hospitality tourism is our bread and butter that would be a huge economic threat to the state. And so for both of those, you know, so we took it very, very seriously. What I started looking at was, okay, they say the hospitals are going to be overwhelmed unless, you know, we we shut down society. So they give you these models and these graphs. All the governors were getting them. 
And then I'm watching every day, and it didn't quite, you know, uh, match what they were saying. So, like, by April 10th, they said Florida's going to have 100,000 COVID patients. And in reality, I think we had, like, maybe, like, 3,000 or something like that. I'm like, okay, this is – something's wrong here. And so what I, I came to the realization of, you know, low impact on, on non-elderly, particularly kids – uh, kids were not necessarily transmitting it more because there was initially a fear about getting kids together in school that it would be like the flu where like, all of a sudden it starts spreading more. So a lot of the elderly didn't want the kids in school. And I took flack when we had that because they were concerned about how the kids would spread it. But it turns out they really weren't doing that. Uh, the hospitals, I was confident we'd have enough hospital room. Uh, and then Bhattacharya did a thing in Stanford where he looked at the antibodies because what we were doing, like, see, you, you test somebody, you're positive. I may have had COVID and not had anything severe and never tested it, so that wasn't showing up. So by doing the antibodies, what Bhattacharya and his team showed was actually it, is much more, it had spread much more than what we thought, but it was also less lethal than we thought. So that, to me, was like, okay, the appropriate course is to help the vulnerable, uh, focus whatever protection on nursing homes, on elderly, you know, with testing, whatever they need. Uh, but you have to have society functioning, and you can't just be in a perpetual state of, of paralysis. And basically what Fauci said, I think it was mid-April of 2020, they said, well, when can states open back up? He said, when there's no cases and no deaths. Well, that's impossible. There was no way you were going to eradicate it by doing that. And so I was like, that is not going to work. We've got to go our own way. And, you know, a lot of it was people like Jay and them, they were not given any recognition. They were actually smeared by people like Fauci uh, for, for, for speaking the truth. So the, so the difficult thing, just I think as an executive is, and why a lot of governors went different than me, it's always easier politically to just defer to the medical people. Say, well, Fauci's saying this, so that, or this, this health bureaucrat saying that. So when I was making these decisions, you know, they were very unpopular with the media, with the bureaucracy, with the left, and even some Republicans, you know, were attacking me. Uh, and I did not necessarily have that much medical backing, not because it wasn't sound. No one was willing to speak out except a few of those guys and, and just the hysteria that had developed. So I think that was, that was a, a, a difficult part of it. But ultimately, you know, after we went on, went on our way, people started looking and they're like, okay, Florida's not doing worse than New York. They're not doing worse than any of these. And so we really started to pick up once people realized. I think part of it was there was so much fear in society. So that really subsided. And then we became very quickly a magnet for people all over the country to come to visit, to move, you name it. And our economy probably in the last couple of years has done as good as we've ever done in the history of the state of Florida. And we've had more wealth move into Florida since COVID than has ever moved into a single state in U.S. history, even adjusted for inflation. The big step to uh, confine an entire nation to its homes. <laughs> that uh, I, I uh, you know, what, so first of all, it was, it was good for me. It was good for you, I can see. I had some responsibilities here. I'm supposed to have college. And, you know, if the kids are all going to die, then you can't have college. But I was supposed to find out about that. And, and then it was also apparent to me the cost of this because kids are young. And take a year and a half out of their life, that's an enormous thing. And, and, and very destructive. I mean, we've seen this in these universities, particularly in New England, how they were isolating these college students, and it led to more depression. I do believe it led to more suicides. Yeah. And in Florida, what I told the universities was, do not police their social life. I was like, these kids need to be kids. They're going to go out. Guess what? A lot of them will get COVID. No one will go to the hospital. And then it'll be gone in six weeks in terms of going through the pot. And that's exactly what happened. I think we had in the first semester, first full semester 2020 uh, in the fall, I think there was like one or two hospitalizations in our university system. And I don't, I think COVID was incidental to the hospitalization. So the cost of const uh, restricting these kids was so much greater than whatever risk they were assuming by living their lives. And I'll tell you, uh, to this day, I will have people come up to me saying, you know, you saved my college experience. You saved our senior year. Like, I think, like, the fact that they were able to do school, a lot of it, a lot of the professors wanted to do remote, and so the schools were, I think, probably a little bit too accommodating on that in that first semester back. But the fact that they could live a normal life was huge, and it was a stark contrast to what we saw throughout most of the United States. 
Something in us wants to know the truth about reality. A nation has to have civic education. The study of history expands you. The core question is why. What is the good? What is the will? These stories cover the whole gamut of experience. Why should you take the time to study these complicated things? Because it's the best single thing you can do. Elections. Uh, it's a fact of the American government that it is the first purely representative government ever built. That means whoever is the sovereign doesn't run any part of the government. They control them. James Madison writes that in the 63rd Federalist. Uh, that means that the only way we have to control the government is through elections. And elections are very controversial now. And they're regulated in new ways that, that, that worry me. So what have you done in... Florida to make sure elections are fair? Well, we've done a number of things. So when I became governor, we removed some of the supervisors in South Florida with my removal power because they had been bungling elections for a long time and got better people in there. And, and those ran very well in 2020 as a result of us doing that. We also have done things like ban ballot harvesting. Uh, we've banned the use of Zuckerbucks, which Zuckerberg pioneered in 2020, where they would take private money through nonprofit groups they give money directly to election offices. So like a county election that administers the election would get millions in Zuckerbucks, and then the organization would send political operatives to work in that office and say, you know, you've got to do mail ballots, you've got to do ballot harvesting, you've got to do all those stuff. So they basically commandeered the machinery of the election for partisan purposes. Now, they didn't say it was for partisan, but they were going to Democrat areas and doing that. So we've banned the use of private money. We also don't allow mass mailing of unsolicited ballots in the mail. If you want an absentee ballot, Florida's had this for many decades, you can request, you got to show ID now, and then they'll send you one. Uh, and then verify your signature on the back end. But just to send all these millions of ballots and just floating around in the ether is a real, real problem. So we put the kibosh on that. But the thing is, is you can have violations of election law. Are they actually going to be prosecuted? So we created an office in state government, the Office of Election Crime. So this is actually an office that will investigate and they can bring charges with it through the attorney general's office. So we've brought charges against people who were illegally in the country and voted, who voted in multiple jurisdictions and had been con some had been convicted of uh, serious uh, crimes and are therefore ineligible to vote. So we were able to do that in 2022, and it made a Im great impact on the 2022 election just in the sense of we didn't have really any problems. I mean, because I had these guys, I'm like, look for any problems you see. Not that it affected my race. I mean, we were fine, but I wanted to see what happened. And I think just the fact that people knew, look, it's not worth violating the election law. Why would you want to get prosecuted for voting if you're not if you're not eligible to vote? So, so we really, I think the fact that we had legal reforms, but then the credible uh, mechanism to actually hold people accountable caused us to probably have the best run election in the country in 2022. So a lot of those things that you've done are called voter suppression now. Nah, yeah, I know. The left says that. And why is that not voter suppression? So first of all, elections used to be you show up on election day, you cast your ballot. All this other stuff is really gone above and beyond what the original conception of election even was. And so uh, we uh, have a right to ensure that the people that are showing up to vote are who they say they are and that there's no problems with, with the process in terms of people voting multiple times or whatever. So what we've done, I think, is provide adequate safeguards where people in Florida can, can feel good that the process has integrity. But the idea that showing ID to vote is somehow suppression is insane. When I was active duty in the Navy, if you wanted to come on that Navy base, you showed an ID. No one said that was suppression. That was just done. Now, all of a sudden, if you don't show an ID to vote, somehow that's suppression. It's nonsense. The left wants anything that's done to ensure the integrity of the process wiped away because they want to be able to exploit gaps in the process to be able to get their way. If uh, I'm going to embellish the point, if I may. Uh, I think that we're living in a mediated society now. The media is everything. everything. And so if there are people who are going around gathering up lots of ballots... The initiative is in them, and it's not in the voter. Yes. And, and that means that 
you know, but what we want is to distribute the authority, not collect it among the powerful. So I praise you for that. Well, and I mean, if you think about it, it's um, what goes into collecting those ballots? What are they doing at the doorstep? Uh, part of the reason you have a secret ballot is because you don't want to have any coercion. You're in there. You're in that booth. You do it. No one knows what you did. Well, if you have somebody from like a union showing up to a union member's family's uh, house saying, I need, you know, where's your ballot? Well, they're not going to turn that ballot in unless they know you voted the way they want you to vote. So they're, they're going to look at that. They're going to they're prod you. And actually, you know, Jimmy Carter and James Baker did a report on this. I cited it in the book. This is probably 10, 20 years ago where they said when the ballots get out of the election offices and end up in people's homes, the chance for coercion and manipulation goes up dramatically. And that's just a basic fact. So why would you want to invite more of that through ballot harvesting and Zuckerbucks? You should want to reduce that. And so that's what we've tried to do in Florida. Now, I, I mean, we have, you know, short period for early in-person voting, all that. I mean, I'd be fine to return to Election Day. I think the public, by and large, likes to have more than one option. And so the legislatures around the country, I don't think any of them have gone back to just that single day voting. But I mean, there is a value of we're making a collective choice with the same information. And when you have some of these states that have early voting eight weeks before the election, you have people voting for the campaign has really even uh, gotten into full swing. And I just don't think that's the, the best thing for the country. That's so good. Uh, James Madison, uh, he, he likes it that the American, he talked about this in the Federalist, the, the people have influence on the government and even control of the government on certain days. And then what they're supposed to do in the meantime is talk a lot. And then they come to a decision and then they get together and they're like a national legislature. And if, and you, you can, I have a friend who's a pollster in California and he tells me that you can track the polls. Uh, if you ask people in May, what's the most important thing to them? They'll say, I have to remember to pick up my dry cleaning. And if you ask them in October, they're thinking about the country and its governance. In other words, they got their minds on it now. And that's, so I think we should do the favor of treating people as if they're thinking people. Let's talk about education. Uh, you first came to my site because we start charter schools in Florida, and it's the best place. Uh, and I noticed that uh, your team... Uh, they would ask us for advice about teaching things. We're teachers around here, and we know how to teach stuff. And that uh, it was easy to give them the advice, and things would happen. Uh, I thought, somebody up there really knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> how do you make all that work? I mean, you tell, uh, describe to people what you've done in education reform. And Well, one of the things we did, and we really uh, appreciate Hillsdale helping, is the... Uh, uh, American Civics Initiative to get civics back in our schools, particularly our high schools, in a really big way. Uh, we got a private donation of $5 million from Bernie Marcus from Home Depot to start a civics speech and debate initiative. We're now almost at all 67 counties are participating in that, and we hosted the national championship last year for that. And I think there's value in that because uh, you know, you may be a big Second Amendment guy, but you may be asked to argue the other side of that. So you got to get out of your comfort zone and vice versa and actually see things and be able to construct arguments. So I think that one of the things that's been lost, particularly in higher education and non-Hillsdale institutions where the, the orthodoxy is so strong, is no one ever questions these kids' assumptions. And so we want to question your assumptions with that. But then the broader issue of civics, there's certain things that you should have when you leave our school system you need to have a certain foundation to exercise the duty of American citizenship. So part of that's having good standards. We now give the seniors a citizenship test when they leave uh, school and they can place out of civics requirements in higher ed if they do well. We may start to say you have to pass it to graduate. We didn't want to do that to start because we didn't fear we feared that the results wouldn't be that great. And they weren't great. They have gotten better. But one of the things we said was you can have the best standards in the world. You need teachers that really appreciate and understand the things. And so we've worked with people from Hillsdale and other top scholars to create a 50-hour course for teachers. And so if they go through it, they get a $3,000 bonus. What are they learning about? They're learning about 
the British Constitution. They're learning about the Protestant influence. They're learning about all the intellectual currents that led to the fa- formation of the American Republic and then the key episodes uh, that have happened since then. And the people that have looked at it, the teachers that have gone through it, we've done, I think, 2,500 teachers have gone through it, 89% uh, approval rate and, and satisfaction rate on the course. And then people that are looking at this, I had because I, I, I meet with legislators from other states, they're like, I cannot believe you guys actually have, you know, this. You have Aristotle, you have you have play, you have all this stuff that the teachers are learning. They're like, so I had one legislator tell me, it brought tears to my eyes to see all this. And so, but that's really the foundation that anyone teaching civics uh, should have. That so we're making the effort to get this right and to make sure that our students have an adequate foundation. My father was a high school teacher in Pocahontas, Arkansas. And he found his happiness, you know, making, by the time he finished, $34,000 a year as a teacher. Thought it was the greatest thing. And he was a big wheel in our town. Uh, When the Clintons were elected in Arkansas, she was placed in charge of education. And what they started doing was things that demote the authority of teachers. It's, uh, you know, first of all, K through 12 education is not rocket science. Only rocket science is rocket science. And, you know, most anybody can do a fair amount of rocket science if they work hard enough, but everybody can learn to read well. And everybody. And so this idea that there should be authority over the schools, I I mean, I I put these numbers together and they shock me, and I'm, I'm experienced now. I shouldn't be shocked. Since 2000, the number of students in public schools have grown seven and a half percent, the number of teachers, eight and a half percent, and the number of administrators, 92 percent. That's a massive fact. And there are now more, slightly more, administrators than teachers in the school system. And why would that be? What's that about? Because, you know, your, your solution then is you help the teachers know. But everybody loves to know. And then if they know, then they can teach. And that's And, you know, it should stop there, really, because it's everybody wants to know. Well, I think in Florida, the the reason, and we may not have it that stark with the Edmund, but it it definitely has grown here, too. And a lot of that, the majority of teachers in Florida are actually not members of the teacher union. Um, The majority of the administrator and other staff, vast majority, are members. And so when they're bargaining, they're actually putting the teachers in the back of the line and trying to service some of the other parts of the school system at the front of the line. So what I did my second year as governor is we, because you know, we, we send money to the school districts to fund the schools, and then they can negotiate with the unions or do whatever. Um, and we're just like, you know what, we cannot have this money being put into administration. So we created what's called a categorical for just teacher salaries. So we'll give you, you know, a billion dollars this year, and other money can be used too, but here's a billion dollars increase each year. It cannot be used for anything else. And so that really helped a lot of our teachers, And but what happened, some of the districts, some of the unions were holding up the pay raise for the teachers because they were using that as leverage to be able to do service some of the administrative staff and some of the others. And so one of the things we're doing this legislative session is doing paycheck protection for, for, for teacher unions. No automatic deductions because they give them a form and you sign the form and it's just authorizing the deductions, but they don't even know how much money's coming out. And of course, when you have multiple deductions in your paycheck, it's easy to get lost in that. Now, if they want to join, they have a right to join, but they've got to write that check and hand that check uh, to the union. And so if they don't have 60% agree to do that, then the union gets decertified. And I think the issue with it is it's been mostly about advancing partisan politics within our school system, the teacher unions not defending the rights of teachers. In fact, a lot of these teachers get in trouble if they just ensure discipline in their classroom. The union's not, not getting their back the way they should on that. The union's more concerned about political correctness and some of the other things going on. So I think Florida, with, with that reform, we are going to probably be more in line with how schools have been run historically prior to a lot of the problems we've seen in the recent generation. I I even think this um, now. I think the growth of administration, I I think the temper of the administrator is different than the temper of the teacher. Because if you go in the classroom, that's hard work. And if what you're doing is regulating in some way from a distance where you never get in front of the kids, well, 
I think the power of the education lobby comes from that class of person. And, you know, the, the education lobby is the start of the whole public employee regulatory state. So you do something about that, you'll do something good. And uh, restore the authority of the classroom. That's, that's where it happens, right? I mean, since uh, Plato's Academy, 20 people, 15 people sitting around in a circle talking. That's how learning happens, see? And we know from the first line of Aristotle's metaphysics, everybody wants to do that. And so facilitate that. Good for you. One thing we're doing just, uh, and I didn't mention before, so we're doing the civics, a uh, big push, important, but we also want to give students a frame of reference to understanding the American experiment. So we have one day a year, November 7th, where students learn about the victims of communists and communist regimes. And so they're getting truth about Marxism-Leninism. They're learning about 100 million dead at the hands of Marxist-Leninist regimes in the 20th century alone. And that has special uh, reverence in Florida because we have a lot of people that have escaped communism, probably have more in our state than any place in the country. And, you know, you think the Berlin Wall falls over, you know, that, you know, it doesn't die. It's still there. It's in our hemisphere again in all these other countries. And so we want students to understand that and have the proper frame of reference because they go to most universities. They're not learning about Mao's body count, you know, with the with the great leap forward. But they need to know that. So you've been making a fuss about colleges in Florida lately. (laughs) Uh, There's a college in Sarasota and you've new college and you've changed the board and you put one of your guys in charge of it, tried to put one of my guys in charge with it. (laughs) (laughs) And you said, you said to me, you thought they'd all want to come because they want to live in the sun. And I said, serious people don't decide where they live by according to the weather. Anyway, tell us about that. Tell us about New College and what you're doing there. So it's interesting. So New College, when I got elected governor, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, we had either my first or second year's governor, the Speaker of the House, who's a friend of mine at the time, came and said, you know, will you get rid of New College with me? I'm like, what is New College? He's like, well, it's down in Sarasota. It's, it's, it's like left of the left. They're not doing great. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. But the legislature just wouldn't go for that. The people in Sarasota wanted to keep it and everything. So we got that. So I'm like, all right, well, we got to do something with it. And so we looked in statute in Florida. It's supposed to be our top honors college in all of Florida, and yet enrollment is cratered, test scores have gone down, and it really became captive to left ideology, gender ideology, CRT, all this stuff. And so my view is, you know, a, a liberal arts university like this does not have the right to just do whatever the heck it wants. It's funded by Florida taxpayers, and we have the right through the people in elections to set the mission of the university. So we Uh, appointed six conservative board members. They fired the president. They hired my former commissioner of education, who's a conservative. He fired the provost. They eliminated DEI and CRT. And then they basically said the mission of this university is to be a classical liberal arts university. And and they referenced Hillsdale College as as, as, uh, something to emulate. And so what happened, though, is these trustees have professors from around the country reaching out saying, how do I get to new college? Parents are asking, how do I apply? And I think it's a function of, and I think Hillsdale's benefited from this, academia has veered so far away from its traditional moorings of seeking truth and, and teaching people you know, how to think for themselves that it's, um, it's almost rare if you have a higher education embracing a return to truth. And so there's a lot of, uh, uh, I think, excitement about this. Now, Rome wasn't built in the day, but what we did, we started them off with $15 million where they can recruit faculty to come. And they've also started a $10,000 scholarship. We see our in-state tuition is low. It's like $6,500. So $10,000 scholarship, you'll get the tuition and a lot of living paid for. So it'll be really, really good. So they're doing things to be able to go. But I do think it's something because the school's small enough where I think we're going to be able uh, to move it in a direction. And here's the thing. Yes, that's what I think a a, a college should be doing, and that's the the direction. But just from a market opportunity, there's all these parents in the country. You see all the people applying to your university. Where can I send my kid without having the university undo everything I've done for 18 years is what they worry about. And so I think if if new college is one that they feel confident in that, there's going to be a lot of people all over the country that are going to want to apply there. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, and 
I want everybody to realize how magnanimous I am to advertise the competition. <laughs> <laughs> but here, but I do think like we we've been uh, yeah the, the press had a conniption when we did this. I mean I, I mean look I roll out of bed they have a conniption but but it raises the issue for a public institution. Uh, you know, do we have a right to have accountability in it? Do we have a right to set the mission as the people of Florida through their elected representatives? And I think yes. I think that we absolutely have to make sure that these universities are serving, you know, valid public purposes. And to the extent to which they're being used to impose ideology or uh, support political activism or quote social justice, that's veering away from what we think is appropriate. And so. Uh, we're not only doing the new college, we're going to do $100 million for the rest of the university system so that they can go recruit faculty as well. The president, so uh, former Senator Ben Sass is at University of Florida. He's going to have money where he's going to be able to go to George Mason or MIT and say, hey, if you come here and teach engineering, we'll pay you this, we'll do all that. So we're trying to you know, create a situation where we're attracting good people and then compensating them for, for doing a good job. Well, I, I think... We're, we're going to do okay here, but uh, I think a lot of colleges are going to be screaming at you, hey, that's not fair. You're doing a good job. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 my, I want to say a word about classical education. Uh, what, what, it, what it has to do with is this. Uh, it has two huge advantages. Classical learning is the first learning in the West, and that means it's not about anything that anybody else said. It's about the things that it's writing about. The first book of history is called The Histories by Herodotus. The name wasn't taken. The first book of ethics is called The Ethics by Her Aristotle. So you can go back to the beginning. And then the second thing is you can step outside your time. You know, the people who give uh, in school, people give young people the advice, you should follow the news every day. I tell them not to. You know, you should learn what things mean. You see? And that's liberating. And then one of the things you learn if you study the classics is nobody ever learned a single thing except as a volunteer. You can't, you can deprive students of information. You can't make them know anything. So these people, I mean, all you're doing is introducing some diversity in this uniformity that calls itself diversity. But all the other stuff that that, that would be uh, replacing, so much of that's just intellectual empty calories. I mean, like if it really had value, it may be different for me politically, but fine, but a lot of it isn't. A lot of that is more of kind of spirit of the age stuff and the stuff you're talking about, you know, that has stood the test of time. And that's something that gives people a foundation for the rest of their lives. How do you think all this would play on the national level? Well, I mean, I think it depends on, on, on what part of what we've discussed. I mean, I think that uh, clearly, uh, I think parents are more concerned about education than ever been before. Now, federal government's role in that is different than what our role in Florida has been, or even on the school boards. We work to elect a lot of school board members throughout Florida, which has been good. But one of the things we're looking to do in Florida and with other states and we would need the federal government to approve this for the DOE, is uh, have uh, a, an accreditor that can have a process and, and have criteria that is more in line with how we believe a university should run. And right now, that's not really there. And of course, that reply, you guys don't take the money, which is smart, but a lot of these others have done it. So to be able to have that, uh, this administration wouldn't approve it, but the next one probably would. Uh, that could really, I think, uh, open up some positive things because there are some of these universities that say, look, I don't want to do a lot of this, but the accreditor is going to ding me um, if I don't do it. Well, if we have Florida, Texas, Georgia, Tennessee having a, a different accreditor and that goes in a Republican administration, a Democratic administration is not going to be able to come in and undo that because there's too many institutions that will be at stake in that point. So I think in terms of higher education reform, I do think there's some things that can be done with accreditation. Let's go back to the, the general for a minute. Uh, the, at the grandest level, yours is a book about the misarrangements of power in America. There are three branches, executive, legislative, and judicial, and they're not doing their jobs, and much of their job has been delegated to a fourth thing. And what you're calling for is to arrange it the way it's supposed to be. And that means the Congress has to make the laws, and the president has to execute the laws, and the courts have to judge according to the laws. Now, that's a tall order. 
That's a big thing. And you give some examples of things you do to make that stronger in Florida. Uh, the most exciting thing that I, is Schedule F, but the veto, the line item veto, those things. Do you think that somebody, do you think a movement can start it? It, it obviously is gonna to have to affect all the branches of government. It's gonna to to involve millions of people. But it's sort of like uh, walking back one of the great transformations in American history, in world history. Uh, in 1890, the government was 8% of the gross domestic product. And almost all of it was in cities and towns. Now it's 52, 53%, and it's centralized. Can that be walked back? I think it's difficult, but I think it can be just because I think people have, have seen the contradictions in more recent years, probably more than in, in, in previous uh, generations. And I think the fact that the, the power has been exercised in a very sharp, weaponized fashion has caused more Americans to take this very, very seriously and really want to see some, some significant change. Now, it will require, I think, an executive who's very disciplined about, about pursuing this case, and it would probably take many, many years. It will require key people in the administration at the secretary and deputy secretary level. And then it would require thousands of people uh, to be in kind of the bowels of the bureaucracy uh, who were serious about reconstitutionalizing government. So, so it's a big project now. One of the things we did in Florida was, you know, we had a very liberal state Supreme Court, four to three liberal split. When I took office, three of the four liberals had to retire because of uh, retirement age. I put three conservatives on. We changed the court for a generation. We now have, I would say, a six to three loose uh, U.S. Supreme Court. I don't think that the six are always dependable. I think we've got two that are 100 percent, and I think the others are varying degrees. But I think you have a court in place now uh, based off the, the Trump appointments that would be receptive uh, to, to upholding some of the actions uh, that, that we discussed, which would probably not have been the case 10 years ago. So that's another good thing. And then I think the missing ingredient is, is how serious is Congress going to be about this? If your only uh, priority is to avoid any, quote, government shutdown, then you're never going to be willing to use the leverage that you need to uh, to rein in the administrative state. In that state, you said that very clearly, but what leverage do they have? The power of the purse. Uh, they can simply not fund uh, offending conduct, or if there's, if there's agencies that are abusing the people's rights. That's, what, that's why Madison said it was the most potent weapon that, that the people's representatives can be armed with, because at the end of the day, an executive, if, you do, like if, the, if the Florida legislature deprived me of funding for one of my agencies, I physically can't do anything with that agency at that point. Uh, or if they curtail it or limit the funding only to certain specified activities, then you're running afoul of the law if you violate that. So, so that's really, I think, key. And then also the lawmaking function, stop delegating decisions to the bureaucracy. Your Congress, you make a determination, but this is all, I mean, it started you know, with Wilson and all these other people over a hundred years, but the idea that only experts can run government, that, oh, you know, Congress can't possibly make these decisions. So let's just give a blanket grant of authority to the EPA so that it's constantly legislating things that have a profound effect on the American economy and can be interpreted differently depending on whether you have a Democrat or Republican administration. They have ceded the lawmaking power uh, which is kind of the, the twin of the power of the purse in terms of those are the two functions of Congress, and they don't want to exercise either of them. Well, Governor, uh, I have uh, watched you be governor, and I never saw anybody better at it, uh, and you have a plan for the country, and I want to thank you for coming on this podcast. It's a proud thing to inaugurate it with you. Godspeed. Thank you.